Josephine will be talking to us about the Kirchhoff type laws for signed graphs. Um, so without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Like you said, I'm gonna be talking about Kirchhoff type laws for signed graphs. And I want to begin by discussing some introductory information. First, I would like to just go over the Laplacian of a sine graph, which is a V by V matrix defined by the degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix where we use the signed adjacency matrix. So we use a degree to represent the number of edges that are incident to a vertex. So if degree one, a vertex one has degree three, and then an adjacency that is positive will show up as a minus one in our uh, Laplacian and an adjacency that is negative will show up as a positive one since we're subtracting the signed adjacency matrix. And from here, I want to quickly go over spanning trees. So spanning tree of a graph is connected, acyclic, and a spanning subgraph. So each uh, spanning tree of this graph here has all four vertices, and you can connect. Uh, there's a path between any two vertices without any cycles. So there's eight spanning trees for this um, graph here. I also want to define something that we call a K arborescence, which is K disjointed rooted trees that span a graph. So instead of having one connected component that spans the graph, you have K of them. So here are, the, are some two arborescences for this graph. You can see that each component is connected in a cyclic, and then together they span the entire graph. These are all the spanning two arborescences for this graph that have a root at V5 and a root of V4. So you can see that all paths emanate away from the rooted vertices. I'd also like to go over a theorem called the total minor polynomial. So if G is an oriented hypergraph with a Laplacian matrix, then you can calculate a polynomial where you subtract an X from every coordinate. So it's kind of like a characteristic polynomial, but there's an X at every entry in the matrix, and then you take the determinant. But you can sum over a particular figure called a contributor, which we'll discuss in a moment. And you can sum over the number of negative, even, and backstep circles in that contributor, where you remove a particular connection. And so this gives you a finest possible sum of the entire graph in terms of contributors. So what is a contributor? First, I would like to go over a bit more regarding these um, two arborescences. So we're going to define this bracket notation by taking four vertices of a graph, and we define it as the number of two arborescences where we have one component rooted at U1 and the containing W1 and the other component rooted at U2 containing W2. So again, those roots are V5 and V4. And here we're using uh, six and one as the other components. So we have a root of uh, V5 containing V6 and then a root of V4 and then containing V1. And as you can see from this arborescence here, you don't have to directly have an adjacency between the two because this component can, uh, has a root of V4, but contains V1 along the path. So we're just counting the number of arborescences where this is the case. And then a transpedance is defined by Kirchhoff to be um, the difference between two arborescence counts where we swap the U1, uh, the W component. So it's calculating the number of components we have rooted at V5 containing V6, rooted at V4 containing V1, and then we subtract swapping the containment from V1 and V6. And here from this graph, there's no way to have a root of V5 that contains V1 and a root of V4 containing V6 that are disjoint, which is why this number is zero. And so the transpedance value for the V5, V4 edge would be four. And so Burke, Smith, Son, and Tutt also said you can calculate the value of this transpedance from the Laplacian by taking the order of the second cofactor and then the, the determinant of the appropriate minor. And that is another way to find this transpedance value. And they decided that there versions of transpedances followed four rules. Um, degeneracy holds, meaning if you try to put U1 or U2 or the Ws in these two different components, you'll get zero for your transpedance value. If you swap the order of the Us or the Ws, you're going to reverse the flow of the energy, so you'll negate the transpedance value. And if you sum around a circle, a cycle here, you'll get zero. Uh, this is shown for length three, but you can use this to extend this to a cycle of any length. And then finally, if you sum around a, ver a vertex star, you will get zero if you are not the source of the sink. And if you're the source of the sink, you'll get the tree number because we have the number, the tree number of the graph flows into the, uh, the source and out of the sink. So we and th but these only work for graphs. So all positive edges. So we wanted to consider extending this, but first I wanna just go over what these each mean. So first, going over the sum around the circle along the natural source strength orientation be zero, being zero. So if you start here at B5, we have four plus four plus one plus one plus one, which gets us to positive 11. And then if you travel in the reverse direction of orientation, you would subtract 11 to get back to zero when you go back to B5, since we always travel in the orientation of the graph from source to sink. Um, if you look at the sum around say B1, we have four flowing in and then one and three, which is four flowing out. So the sum around the star of a vertex is zero. 
we can look at the sum around V5, which is we have four and then 11 flowing out, which is 15, and the tree number of this graph is 15. And then you can also look at the sink to see we have, again, 15 flowing into it. So now I want to talk about contributors, which I think I've mentioned a couple times. So we define um, tail equivalence to be identical for things that have equivalent tail incidence maps. And so a contributor is a figure where we take a number of paths of length one equal to the vertex set, and we map them into the graph. So here I have a couple of contributors, and we allow something called back steps where we allow paths to fold back onto themselves. So the idea is we take all the sets of ways that you can map, uh, for in this case, four paths of length one into the graph, such that you cover the entire vertex set with heads and tails uh, once. So every vertex has a head and a tail on it, but we do allow a path to fold back on itself. And we say that two contributors are tail equivalent if they have identical tail incidence maps. And then we say that the, we have an activation order where we say that if you can imagine folding out these back steps, we have that contributor being less than the other contributor. So this contributor here is an identity permutation because every path fell back onto itself. And I could imagine folding out each path to get the contributor above. The same in this case, but one of my paths cannot fold out since if I fell out, I would have two uh, head path maps at this vertex and I'm only allowed one. So you don't have to fold out every back step when you unpack, just as many as you can. And this gives us a lot of important information. So for a bi-directed graph, we say that all activation classes of the graph are Boolean lattices. And so the classes are going to sum to zero if any contributor in them contains a positive circle. We also define a reduced activation class to be the set of contributors where U goes to W and then UI, the UIW maps are removed. So U and W sets are both vertice sets. And we denote this with a hat over the A for removal. And then we have the set of all reduced activation classes. So here is that graph again, and we're going to see that we can have sets of activation classes where we have V5 go to V4. So here are the contributors within these three different activation classes where I have a map from five to four. These contributors are grayed out here because the V5, V4 map is actually represented as back steps. So these would be the reduced portions of the activation classes in bold, where we take only the classes where V5 goes to V4. Looking at that middle class, we have that a bi-directed graph, the set of all single elements in a reduced activation class unpack to k arborescences where k is the length of u. So if we take that middle class and beyond having v5 go to v4, we take the subclass where we also have v2 go to v3, which is going to just be this single element here. This one again, it would be the unpacking of this back steps. So we take the class and we reduce it down to a single element. And then we remove the V5 goes to V4 and the V2 goes to V3 connection, and we're left with a two arborescence. If there were any on back steps, we would need to unpack them here. If you choose K to be one, you actually get the matrix tree theorem through this process. There's a bijection between, tut, between Tut's two arborescences of the form with this bracket notation and the single element reduced activation classes where we send U to W. So here are a group of the single element reduced activation classes where we have V5 go to V4 and then V1 go to V6. Any of the single element ones here will unpack into two arborescences. So if you imagine folding out these back steps, we'll have two components that span the graph and are acyclic. Positive circles, which is going to include any digon, causes cancellation. So non-trivial classes will never appear in graphs. They might appear in sign graphs. So the contributor-based transpedance for a determinant, or we're going to call this the decontributor transpedance, we define by summing over those figures to the even circles, negative components, and back steps. And this is actually the degree two coefficients of the monomial and the total minor polynomial. So from here, we would like to point out that there's a direct relationship between touch transpedances and the decontributor transpedances, where you can just take, where all you have to do is adjust for a sign. So if the number of vertices is odd, then you switch the sign. If the numbers of vertices are even, the two values will be the same. And this allows us to extend Kirchhoff's laws to sign graphs. So if you assign graph with source U1 and sync U2, and you pick two vertices, then there's two results of Kirchhoff's laws that immediately hold, degeneracy and energy reversal. So again, if you repeat a U or a W component, it's zero. And if you swap the U's or the W, you're going to sum, you're going to swap the sign. And you can think about this as we can't, for the proof of one, we can't have U1 go to both W1 and W2 and still be a contributor by definition, because you can only have one head and one tail map at each vertex. And for the proof of two, you can think about how changing the order is going to add or remove one even cycle. And since the sign of the contributor is determined by even cycles plus negatives plus back steps, adding or removing one even circle will directly just alter the sign. 
I'd like to define a couple more things for this. So we let M minus UW be the set of maximal elements that are positive circle free. So if you remember each Boolean lattice, it will have a maximal element. So if we take all these maximal elements and we only select the circle free ones, we can actually form the decontributor transpedence by summing over all those elements with the appropriate sign times two to the number of negative circles in the maximal element. And this is because they are Boolean lattices and we can prove that every element in a positive circle free activation class will have the same sign. And this tells us that the only non-arborescence contributors that appear must have all circles negative within their activation class. So for the conservation version for sign graphs, you don't have the same conservation that we have for, did I actually skip a slide? No. Yeah, I actually went one to slide far too far. Um, so for the cycle conservation, there's actually a matching of contributors around the cycle as opposed to a cancellation. So non-trivial classes will cancel if and only if there's a positive circle, but the best you can do in sign graphs is pair off contributors as they move around a cycle because sequential elements and reduced contributors may not have the same sign. So cycle conservation in a graph is actually a consequence of the cancellation of non-trivial classes and the fact that elements will have a matching sign. And then the version of vertex conservation for sign graphs is a similar idea of matching. If you take a vertex that's not the source of the sink, then the number of contributors that enter and exit the vertex are the same, um, but the number of the signs may not be. There's a matching again, similar to the previous one. But if you take a vertex that is the source of the sink, there's a matching between contributors that exit the source and enter the sink. So let's look at an example of this. So here we have a sign graph. And here I have um, the activation classes that we're going to need. So we're picking again source V5 and sink V4. And we want to examine the 5 goes to 5, 4 goes to 4 um, contributor. So this is the V5, V4, V5, V4 decontributor transpedence. So we're putting a back step at each one of these. And then we're going to remove them. And we're left with all of these activation classes, which includes two non-trivial activation classes. These are not going to cancel because if you look at the circle here, it's a negative circle. We multiply the two positives and the negative to get a negative. So these two contributors will not actually cancel. They would cancel on a graph. And so when we add these up, we're going to get 12. And it's going to, so this edge will be assigned a plus or minus 12, depending on the direction of travel. If this were a positive graph, these four would cancel. And so our sum would be eight. There are actually many more cancelable classes than non cancelable classes. So here is a whole group of uh, contributors that we didn't show on the previous slide because they cancel. Anything that has this diagon that uses a, an adjacency twice will always cancel since we're just multiplying a sign by itself. Squaring a sign will always make it positive, which means it has a positive circle. These do actually give us a hypothetical maximum though for each edge and we can count them by the permanent. So transpedence is labeled adjacency, not edges. So the problem we want to address next is to determine a hypergraphic analog of Kirchhoff's laws via adjacencies. Just a little two minute warning. Uh, so the one more result that I'd like to go over is that a contributor is on an edge if and only if it contains a unique source sync path through the graph union that edge. So here we have that graph again and we have its labeling with the transpedence values. I'm going to show how we can find that path. So here we put all the contributors on the edge they're associated with. And if we pick a contributor, we can add in we can fold out back steps, but you can see this highlighted shortest source sync path. And we can follow those contributors as they actually move around that path on the graph just by adding back in the messing edge. That's those three here and these three here. And then we see them again here. This one contributor that doesn't follow is because its shortest source sync path is this outer path. So if you put back in the missing edge, you can follow it around the outer path from source to sync. So it's actually a contributor sort from source to sync. And Tut's transpedences is actually a spanning tree sort based on the shortest source sync path. So thank you for your time. Okay, round of applause. You can react in the chat if you'd like. Are there any questions? That was great. I have a question. Maybe I'm I'm a little cu curious. So the the Kirchhoff stuff comes from comes from electrical electrical engineering, I suppose. And so does this relate back? Could this does this have motivation? This this particular directed craft stuff. I mean, I don't have any motivation for it. Um, I'm it's fun. It's math, but <laughs> it could theoretically be used for things related to non-conservative circuits. Okay. I'm curious about your um, future directions um, after, like, from this result. 
what so are your next steps? I'm hoping to extend Kirchhoff's laws to work for hypergraphs, which are graphs that allow edges to be connected to more than two vertices. They have an issue where an adjacency, there's multiple adjacencies within an edge. So this adjacency principle of having a single adjacency you can map to doesn't translate immediately. So that's the next thing I plan to do with this. And there is a paper about this on Arvix that's under review for publication. Awesome. Yeah, I was actually gonna ask about hypergraphs, but I wasn't sure because I'm not in graph theory. So I wasn't totally sure if that was like a valid question, but that's cool that that's your next step. Thank you for your time. Thank you.